Before I begin, I want to let you in on a little secret. The title of this talk is what my dog can tell us about the problem of evil. A better title for this talk would be what my dog and his fleas could tell us about the problem of evil. But my wife would be offended if I even suggested that our dog has fleas. So, you know, just next time you see my wife, please don't tell her that I pretended like my dog has fleas. So, again, we're talking about the problem of evil here, but what is the problem of evil? The way that I'm talking about it, it's an argument or a family of arguments that go from the claim, we've got certain kinds of evil in the world, to the claim that God doesn't exist. So before we get started, we need to get clear about what evil is and this thing I'm calling God. So just get clear up on some terminology. When I'm using the term evil, the precise definition doesn't matter all that much. Most people think that no matter how we talk about evil, you're going to be able to get a problem in the neighborhood up and running. So I'm just going to be talking about evil as though it's closely connected with pain and suffering, especially pain and suffering that isn't deserved. So think of the Holocaust. There was a lot of pain and suffering involved that, wasn't, that maybe apparently wasn't deserved. There was also a lot of pain and suffering going on in Haiti right now because of the earthquake. Uh, apparently, again, this isn't deserved suffering. So this isn't a definition of evil. It's still very vague. But that's going to be more than enough to work for our purposes. I am going to give you a definition of God. By God, I mean an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good person. There are other concepts of God out there, other interesting concepts of God. But the very fact that Christians, uh, Muslims, and Jewish people accept this notion of God makes it pretty interesting if we can disprove that this God exists. Even if there's some other God exists, if we can show that this God doesn't exist, we've done something interesting. We've shown that Christians, Muslims, and Jewish people have a false belief, namely that this particular being doesn't exist. Now that we are a little bit clear about some of the relevant terminology, we can present what I will be calling the problem of evil. Notice the problem of evil has two premises. The first one is, if God exists then there's a good reason to allow every evil that does in fact exist. The second premise is that there are in fact no good reasons to allow these evils, so that gives us the conclusion that God does not exist. The argument form is good, that is to say, if the premises are in fact true, we really do have a good reason to believe that God does not exist. So what we need to think about is whether the premises are true. We need to think about whether there are any good arguments to believe what I'm calling P1 and P2. That's what we're going to turn to now. Why should we believe P1? Well, I've got an analogy with a good mother and her child, and I'll show, show it to you. So notice that mommy and baby are conveniently labeled here. Apparently, you can actually buy these t-shirts online. I think this site is like glamajama.com. I, I, you know, so like if, uh, for you philosophy professors, if you need to label your wife mommy for some reason, you know, go to this website and uh, you'll, you'll know who your, the mother of your child is. Okay. So the analogy with good mommy. It looks like if the mother really is good, she's only going to allow an evil to befall her child for one of three reasons. Either she doesn't know about the evil, she isn't powerful enough to stop it, or she's got a good reason to allow. If the mother's really good, she still may not know that fire ants crept into the sandbox, she may not know that her child is playing with the stove, or daddy left out poisonous cleaning materials. She may not know these things, and so she may not be in position to prevent the child from drinking the poisonous materials, from getting bitten by the fire ants, or burning himself with the stove. The second reason, remember, that she might allow an evil to befall her child is simply that she's not powerful enough to stop it. She may see the car or the bus coming, but not be able to run to her child in time to pull him out of the way. The third reason is that she might have a good reason to allow her child to suffer some evil. For example, intense suffering or pain. She might have a good reason to allow him to undergo a painful surgery, for example, or to get a shot. Baby is going to be very upset, he's going to be crying, scared, but in the end, mommy thinks it's best for him. So there are three reasons we talked about that a good mommy might allow baby to undergo evil. 
But notice that two of them dealt with limitations. Two of them were, she didn't know enough, and she isn't powerful enough. But these two limitations don't apply to God. God knows everything there is to know about evil, including when it's going to strike and how to stop it. Plus, he's all-powerful, right? He can stop any evil that he knows about. This leads us to believe this. If God exists and allows some evil to happen, then the only reason that applies to him is that he's got a good reason to allow it. He'll never allow evil because he doesn't know about it, and he'll never allow evil because he's all-powerful, because he doesn't is it powerful enough? He doesn't have those limitations. So if a evil strikes and God exists, we know that he must have had a good reason to allow it. Now what we've just done is we've just given an argument that shows that P1 is true. Just about everyone grants P1. Just about everyone will say, something like this analogy with good mommy is going to get us to something like P1. So all the action is with P2. What we really want to know is, is there a good reason to believe P2? Everyone's willing to grant P1, so let's now turn to P2. Now, the argument that we'll be considering in favor of P2, I'm calling an evil noceum inference. You don't know what the word noceum means yet. Don't worry about that yet. I'll get to it in a minute. First, just let's look at the argument, and then we'll spend some more time talking about it. The first premise here is that we can't find a good reason to allow much of the evil in the world. Start thinking about the earthquake in Haiti. Most of us, we're going to sit around thinking all day long. We're not going to be able to find a good reason to allow, I think the latest death count I saw was 150,000 people dying. Is that right? At any rate, in the Holocaust, just think about that. Can you find a good reason for allowing all those people to suffer in that way? We just look around. We can't find any reason that would justify God in allowing these evils. But if we can't find a good reason to allow these evils, the second premise says, then there aren't any such reasons. So, this gives us a conclusion that P2 is true. That there are no good reasons to allow much of the evil that we have in this world. Since, remember, P2, the key thing is we've got to have some good reason to believe P2. We're considering this noceum inference, so now we need to get clear about noceum arguments and when they're good. Get, actually, get clear about what a noceum inference is. So let's talk about noceum inferences, naughty and nice. So noceum inference, and I, I guess we're supposed to imagine, I didn't come up with the term noceum inference, but when you read this little quote, thing in quotes, I think you're supposed to imagine Someone wearing overalls, like in Backwoods, Georgia, saying this. So, I know see them, so they ain't there. Right? The basic idea of a no see inference is, you go from the fact you can't find something, to the conclusion that it isn't there. So, I know see them, it ain't there. What I'm going to argue now is that no see inferences are good or nice only if we can reasonably expect to find what you're looking for. So this is where the, my dog and his fleas come in handy. Suppose that I, I'm looking for my dog. And I'll show you a picture of him. Here he is. Clearly he is very ferocious looking. Reminds you of a gigantic grizzly bear baring his teeth. So we need a bear. Uh, he's a West Highland Terrier. And one really